Take me back to the place that feels like home, to the people I can depend on, to the faith that's in my bones. Take me back to a preacher and a verse where they've seen me at my worst, to the love I had at first. Oh, I wanna go to church.
And we're going to read a few uh, verses from here. If you're physically able, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to start in verse 12. The Bible says, Then the band and the captain of the officer of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to, a, I don't know, Annas first, and for he was father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And if you don't remember, that was back a few chapters. Caiaphas was letting them know that Rome was going to turn somebody over and going to kill somebody. It was something they did annually. And you guys know the story when uh, Barabbas was released and Jesus was imprisoned and eventually killed. Um, so that's Caiaphas. He's the one that's heading the charge to come against uh, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Verse 15, and the Bible says, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. Uh, that disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. Now, uh, just by way of uh, familiarity, many believe that, that is the Apostle John. John never refers to himself by name. He always refers to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved or that other disciple. Some believe it could have been uh, John Mark, a very young John Mark, but there's nothing to corroborate that. But anyway, I know that has nothing to do with it, but just want to kind of help you out here maybe a little bit. So uh, verse 16 says, But Peter stood in the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then said the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. And verse 18 is our text for the day. And the servants and officers stood there who made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Now remember, Jesus told Peter that he would deny him. Did he not? Jesus told him that. And we're going to look at that here in Luke chapter 22, uh, verse 31. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before thou shalt thrice, thrice deny that thou knowest me. So today, as we look at this passage, I want to key on the one verse in verse 18. And, that's, and the servants and the officers stood there, who made a fire of coals, for it was cold. And they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for another opportunity to be in your house. Lord, I thank you for these that are here. Lord, I thank you for those that are tuning in on live stream. I know that uh, Missy's physically unable to be here, Miss Mary, uh, Miss Linda. Uh, there are those, Miss Willow May, that just can't be here. I pray, Lord, that you would just uh, Lord, put all of our hearts in the same place right now. We're ready to hear from you. And Lord, I pray that we would have liberty this morning, God. You know each heart here, God. I do not. Lord, you know right where, we, where each and every heart is and the things that we struggle with. Uh, Lord, the things that uh, we need. So, God, I'm asking you to do what only you can. I pray the Holy Spirit would have this liberty today, God. I pray you'd help me to get out of the way and let you do what only you can. And, Lord, if there's someone here that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior, I pray that today, God, they would see uh, what Jesus has done for them, Lord. They would uh, allow him to, to redeem them uh, from their sinful state, God. We ask this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thank you for standing and be seated. So, I want to ask three questions as we get into this. And I don't know where my questions were. They were in my notes. Well, that's funny. That's very funny. I, I'm sorry. I, I'm being serious. My questions are gone. But I still have them because they're going three. I'm not that dense, okay? So, one, where are we most comfortable? Where are we comfortable? Two, why are we comfortable? And three, who are we comfortable with? These are the questions that I'm asking, and we'll get back to those here in a minute. But as we look at Peter's life at this point, I believe that he is all aboard the struggle bus. Okay, here he is. He's warming himself by the fire, according to verse 18. Okay? He has already denied Christ one time when he walked in. The lady that kept the door said, Hey, you're one of his disciples. He said, I am not. Now, each of the Gospels give an account of this, and Luke and Matthew tell a little bit differently. Um, that he said, I don't know him. They said, don't you know him? And he said, I don't know him. And you might be like, well, which one is the most accurate? The Bible. <laughs> okay? He could have said all of them. And, but each account uh, gives this that he denied Christ. And so, uh, I want to look at Peter up to this point, okay? Kind of, if you go through the Gospels and, 
You know, uh, Peter knew that Jesus was the Son of God. There was no doubt in Peter's mind that he knew that Jesus was the Son of God. Uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse 15 says, He saith unto him, unto them, But whom say ye that I am? This is Jesus talking to his disciples. Uh, because he said, Whom do man say that I am? And so now he's asking them. Uh, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter knew who Jesus was. He knew that he came from God. He knew he was virgin born. He knew he was a perfect man. And he knew that he was the Son of God. Peter knew that he was not worthy to be with Jesus. He knew that he was a sinful man. Look at Luke chapter 5, verse 8. Now, you don't have to turn there. I'm going to read it just because I'm going to be a minute, okay? So, uh, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And I love that story. Peter was out on the boat, and Jesus said, Thrust out a little further and let down your nets. And Peter said, But I just fished all night long, okay? And I ain't catching up. We don't go out in the daytime. He says, nevertheless, if I were. And so Peter goes out and he drops the net. They bring in a, fit, a, drop, a haul of fishes like Peter had never seen before. And when he sees that haul of fishes, he says, oh my word, this is somebody special. God revealed to Peter at that point in time that this man on his boat was more than just a man. And so he knew that he was not worthy to be around. He said, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. He knew that Jesus was going to deliver him from Rome and was willing to fight with and for Jesus. And you might be like, well, Jesus wasn't going to deliver them from Rome. I know. But that's what Peter believed. He believed it so much that last week we talked about it. He believed it so much that when the, the guards and the high priest uh, 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 soldiers came uh, to take Jesus, what did Peter do? He believed that it was time to fight. He thought, well, this is it. Rome is coming to get Jesus, and Jesus is going to wipe out Rome. He pulls out a sword, and he goes to take off Malchus' head and takes off Malchus' ear. Peter believed Jesus was the deliverer. And you might be like, well, why did Peter believe that? Look at the cycle of, uh, of the children of Israel throughout the Old Testament. Uh, again and again, the children of Israel would get uh, right with God, and they would follow God, and then they would allow the things around them and the gods around them to distract them and to pull them away from God, and they would start serving another God. And listen, folks, if you're serving anything but Jesus Christ, you're serving a false God. Amen. Okay? If you're serving yourself, you're serving a false God. You are not your God. You have no business being your God. You've got a God. And so uh, uh, they, they would get right with God, and they would follow God, and then they would just get distracted, and they would start following something else, and God would allow them to be into bondage. And each, each time, if you go through Judges, I'm studying through Judges, I've been studying through Judges for a little bit here. Uh, matter of fact, if you want to talk a little bit about it, this afternoon, some weeks ago, we might be talking a little bit more about Judges. Uh, but um, as you look at the, 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 the book of Judges, each time the children of Israel step further and further away from God, they spend more and more time in bondage. The years start to go from 10 years to 15 years to 20 years to 30 years to 40 years. And it gets more and more. And I mean, at this point in time, it's been 400 years. It's been 400 years since they've heard a prophet besides John the Baptist who had finally come, who was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, the predecessor of the Savior. And so the children of Israel were as far away from God as they'd ever been. You understand that? The children of Israel were as far away from God as they'd ever been. And, 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 and they weren't going to get any closer without a deliverer. And so Rome had been uh, oppressing them. They were under tribute. Uh, they were paying taxes. They were uh, having to do things uh, the Roman way. What they wanted to do went against Rome and they couldn't do it or else they would uh, be imprisoned. They were in bondage. They wanted a deliverer. The children of Israel were looking for a deliverer. They were looking for a Moses, a, a, a Samson, um, a Gideon, a Deborah, Barak. They were not looking for what Jesus was. Even though they should have been, because if you go further back in the Old Testament, uh, the entire book of, of Genesis tells of Jesus coming and, and Numbers and, and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. The entire Pentateuch talks of, uh, of that salvation is going to come to man. Uh, the entire Old Testament speaks of Jesus. There's no way they should have not been ready for who Jesus was. But guess what, folks? We get lost. I know I'm talking about lost in our sin, even though that's what I'm talking about. We get lost in religion. We get lost in doing our step-by-step -step traditions. And we get lost in doing things the way that we've always done them. And you know, traditions can be a God. Doing things just because that's the way you like them to be done can be a God. Peter 
was ready to fight. Peter was not a man of fear. He was not. Nowhere in my Bible do I find Peter being a man of fear, not one time. Peter had no problem telling Jesus what he believed. Anybody ever argue with Jesus? <laughs> Peter set the goal. I mean, he set the standard. He was the one that did it right. Okay, Don't do it right. He's the one that did it often. Matthew 26, verse 33 says this. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Now, Jesus had just told the disciples that in a matter of just a little bit of time, they were all going to leave him and all going to forsake him. And Peter said, I'm not. I know my heart, God. I'm not going to leave you. I'll not forsake you. I'll not quit following. He said that I won't be offended. That means I'm not going to stop. Whatever happens is not going to stop me from following you. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, this night before the cock crow, that's the night of thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise said all the disciples. So how does Peter find himself here? By the fire. Warming his hands in the hall of Caiaphas, the high priest. How did he get here? And we go back to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. The Lord had prayed. And again, I encourage you to le read your Gospels. Read the Gospels chronologically. Okay? And I don't mean like Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I'm talking about uh, time frame. Get you uh, a way to read the, the, the Gospels chronologically. All you got to do is Google it. There's, there's stuff out there to help you know which way to read. Because I did it, and I'm not that smart. So. And it's good. Okay, it helps you kind of just see the life of Christ in a, in, in a better uh, way. And so I encourage you to do that as you read your Bible. And so uh, Peter uh, uh, had, had fallen asleep and Jesus had woken him up and, and said, you know, watch and pray. You're going to enter into temptation. And Peter says, Lord, I'm going to keep following you. And the Lord says, Peter, uh, Satan had desired to sift you. And I'm praying for you that when thou art converted, now listen, that I, I can't help but think, if I'm Peter, and that's what I do, I think about how, how would I feel if I'm standing here and I've given my life to follow Christ and I'm going to do everything that Christ wants me to do and I've done everything he's asked and I'm going to fight and I'm going to do everything and I promise I'm going to follow him all the way. And Jesus says, but when thou art converted. Now that means you're not thinking the right way, but when you think the right way, you'll strengthen the brother. God, Jesus Christ told Peter, you, you still don't know who I am, but now that I told you I know who I am. And Peter says, God, Jesus said, you don't know who I am. You still don't know why I've come, or else you're going to pull the sword out. He says, Peter, you need to be converted. I can't imagine how that would have felt to somebody who'd given his life. I know that if it was me, and listen, there's two uh, people in the Bible that I associate with the most, and that would be Elijah because he's a smart aleck. And Peter, because he puts his foot in his mouth and he likes to argue, and he's very confrontational. I associate very well with those things. And so I don't really feel it a stretch to hear Jesus say that, and it cut me to the quick, and I, I know me, I would get mad at Jesus for saying something like that. I would get mad. And usually what happens is when the Lord tells me that I'm thinking the wrong way, and I'm doing it the wrong way, and I'm following the wrong way, then I get upset. And I get upset, and then I start to, I, 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 call, I call in my inner lawyer, right? When I object, I object. Uh... Leading the witness. That's not who I am. And I start to defend myself and where I stand. I start to defend what I believe. Much like Peter has done. And so when Christ lays this on him, Peter, you need to be converted. You need to change the way you think. You need to really understand who I am. I can't have really that hard a time understanding why Peter is where he's at. You understand also that Peter and I am. You're not hurt, right? Because I'm nowhere near my notes yet. I'm just, this is, this is I call it freestyle. Peter had grown up going to synagogue when he was a boy. There was no choice. Everybody went to synagogue. No choice. No free will. You went to church. Now, I didn't have free will when I was a kid. I did. I did what I was told. If not, it hurt. Okay? There was no free will. My parents didn't go to church. And there's nothing wrong with making your kids go to church. But Peter had grown up in synagogue. He, he had heard the law. He had even memorized some of it. As a matter of fact, I believe that uh, in your first 13 years of life, uh, your job is to memorize the Pentateuch as a young Jewish boy. So Peter wasn't unfamiliar with the religious crowd. He would had a, 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 a rabbi that had taught him. 
I don't believe Peter was here because he was afraid. If he was afraid, he wouldn't have followed Jesus to Caiaphas' home. Because that's what he did when the soldiers came to Jesus. What did he do? He followed. He went, what's happening here? Now, while he's following, this is just, again, I just put myself in these positions a little bit. I'm trying to think about that. While he's following, why would Jesus say that to me? Why would he say when I need, when I need to burn? Why would he tell me to put my sword away? I thought that's what we're going to do. Why is this happening? What is going on? He's not supposed to be taken hostage or taken prisoner. He's supposed to be delivering us from Rome, not being delivered under Rome. What is going on? I believe it was more curiosity than Christianity that caused him to follow Jesus as he was being taken. He gets to Caiaphas' hall, and uh, uh, I believe John, uh, the Apostle John, the one writing the, uh, the gospel here, I believe he knew uh, Caiaphas or, or, or Annas, whoever it was that he was here with. I knew that, uh, I believe that he knew them. The Bible says that other disciple uh, said, Hey, uh, uh, I know this man. Let him in. He's a friend of mine. The woman, I'm sure, knew that John was a disciple of Jesus. And she sees Peter and says, you were a disciple of Jesus. This was his first denial. And he said, I am not. I don't know it. No. Nope. <clears throat> and I don't think Peter was afraid he was going to get took. I personally believe that by this time, Peter's not, not sure if he wants to be a follower of Christ. And we'll get into this again. We'll get into this much as we go through after the crucifixion. We'll start really seeing the heart of Peter and what happens here. What happens because of where he's at right now? Where he ends up because of where he's at right now? So he says, I don't know him. I'm not, I'm not the same. This was his first denial. Now why had his beliefs changed so much? Or had they changed? Or was he just trying to blend in? Because he knew the crowd that he was there with. He was standing in the same place as the religious leaders, the officers, and the members of the synagogue. He was trying to blend in. Don't forget John was blending in too. You know, Peter gets a bad rap. You know John, the one writing this gospel, is with Peter almost at every step as we go through the rest of the gospels. From this point on, John is almost always with Peter. The only time you see John being in a good place is when he's at the foot of the cross and Jesus gives him this, the, the care of his mother, Mary. Nothing to do with the message Peter was there at the fire and he was making himself comfortable. Now, I want you to understand, Peter was not with the worldly crowd. I've heard this preached from this passage. I've heard it preached and taught a few times that this is why we don't go and hang out with the worldly crowd. The only problem is he's not hanging out with the worldly crowd. He's not in a bar, okay? He's not, he's not out on the streets. Uh, you know, I, my wife and I went somewhere worth telling everybody we went out west because... We went to a place that is called Sin City. All right. Let me tell you something. We did not have to take very many steps to just see how uh, depraved man is. We didn't have to walk very far. But that's not where Peter was at. Peter wasn't walking the streets where man was being depraved and, and showing his sinfulness. Peter was in the hall of the high priest, the man of God. He was here with the officers of the church, the synagogue, the, the leaders, the rabbis, the members. And he's making himself comfortable. It was a cold place. That's why the fire was there. He was warming his hands, the Bible says. They were warming their hands. It was a cold place. Can I say this? Can I say this? Outside of Jesus Christ, a Christian's heart is cold. When we're not with Christ, when we're not following Christ, when we're not following him to the best of our ability, we become a very cold individual. Cold in the way we feel towards other people. Cold in the way we act towards other people. Cold in the way we fellowship. Cold in the way we sing. Cold in a lot of ways. But they were there and they were warming themselves. You know why people have to... And listen, I know there are those of you thinking, well, this is going to be about the thermostats. It's not. Okay? I know we have an internal struggle always here at church about where the thermostat should be set. Uh, because some of you are hot, some of you are cold, and uh, some of you don't care or else you don't say anything, but you know, that's not what this is about. But they were there warming themselves. And I can't help but think about this, is they were warming themselves. And if, if you're if you're supposed to be a religious person or someone that's following uh, God in your life, why do you have to warm yourself? Shouldn't his presence be what you need? You know. 
I've been given the righteousness of God. And if you're a child of God, you've been given the righteousness of God. Nothing I will ever do is ever going to make me more righteous than I've already been made. And nothing I will ever do is going to make me less righteous than I've been made. Because my righteousness has nothing to do with me and everything to do with Christ. These were there warming themselves. So self type righteousness. And Peter now was warming himself and he stood with them. So then I asked, how did Peter get here? One, he disagreed with Jesus. He disagreed with Jesus. Especially over the last four years, I think, three or four years, I've watched a lot of people who believe this book and gave their life to follow this book and would fight with whoever came against this book. And I know a lot of them want nothing to do with church now. Want nothing to do with church people. Want nothing to do with the things of God. I've seen it happen a lot. I know, I know men who have stood in a position that, like, I, like I have here uh, as a, the pastor of a church. I've heard uh, just the last couple of weeks, I've heard three stories of men who have uh, been called by God to lead other people who believed this book and fought for this book and, 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 and tried to lead others to do the same. That have uh, allowed uh, some sin or something to be coming in their life that they kept seeking for years. And listen, folks, the Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Listen, don't be deceived. God is not mocked whatsoever, man. So if that's how you also reap, that's the law of God. It's going to happen. You're going to be found out. Amen. There are men that are serving time in jail, men that are already serving time in jail because of the unspeakable acts that they have allowed into their lives as they were following. As they were fighting with anyone who came against them. I love my devotion time. And I'll say it again since I've been pastor, I've pushed and pushed and pushed for each and every one of you to have a time where you spend some time devoted this book, to the God of this book, to getting to know him better. Well, listen, I love the verses that say that they that are weak will renew their strength and get wings as eagles. And I love those verses. I love the verses that give us all the flowery things, and those are all good and well. But can I tell you that I would say 90% of the time that I get into this book, Jesus tells me what a wretch I am. Jesus tells me how messed up I am. Jesus tells me how wrong I am. And so I am then presented with a choice. Am I going to argue with Jesus and disagree with Jesus, or am I going to agree with him and say, yes, sir, I'm a mess, I'm a wretch, I need all that you are and none that I am. I believe Peter got here because he disagreed with Jesus. I believe we need to be careful. We talked a little bit about this once tonight. I believe we need to be careful about fighting to prove that we're right. Peter knew he was in the right place. He was by the side of Jesus when he pulled out that sword and took off Malchus's ear. He knew he was right. He knew beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was standing in the right place. And yet, can I say to you, he was not right. And we know he wasn't right. Why? Because Jesus corrected him. Jesus corrected him after arguing with him already. After trying to set him straight, Peter still went and says, right, can I say it is not a good thing to argue with God, but I am so glad that God is patient with me and sometimes I argue with him and I say, Lord, that's not really who I am. He says, yes it is, but you're not being who I am. And so I present with a choice. Am I going to argue with him? Am I going to disagree with him? Or am I going to follow him? And then I get to the point, if I don't follow him, where I'm going to prove that I'm right. My inner lawyer comes out, and once I prove to Jesus that I'm right, which means you're not listening to him, or I'm listening to you, then I'm going to prove to everybody else that I'm right. And listen, let me tell you something. I am not a doctor of theology, but I know this book. I know this book, and if I wanted to, I can find just what I need in this book to show you that you're wrong. Not because he wants you to, wants me to, but because I want to. And I can find a way to take this book and justify who I am right where I am. 
Matter of fact, it's not even that hard. It's really not. And I can use this book to make myself look very, very good. Now, of course, I'm not looking actually in the book. I'm just using words, using the sword for myself to prove that I'm right to others. I'm not allowing the sword to be used on me. Peter disagreed with Jesus. It won't be long after you disagree with him that you're going to fight and prove that you're right. But then Peter was about to find out exactly who he was. Because I don't care if you're a child of God and you have breath in your lungs, God is not done trying to convince you who's right. He is not done convicting you with the Holy Spirit, using the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God to come to you and tell you, you're wrong, my love, you're wrong, we you follow me. Peter was about to find out. Without even thinking, Peter did exactly what Christ said he would do. In John chapter 18, verse 17, we see that then said the damsel that kept the door to Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. In verse 25, he says, And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. And they said, they said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. In verse 26, the Bible says, One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, said, did not I see thee in the garden? I saw you cut off Malchus's ear. You were standing with Jesus and said, I am not, I swear. And he uses some superlatives to make his point. Peter then denied again. And immediately the cop crew. Then if you look in, and if you, if you, well, there's a moment. Luke chapter 22, verse 61 says this. And now you understand Jesus is there. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus hears everything. Jesus hears everything. The Bible says the Lord turned and looked unto Peter. And Peter remembered the word of the Lord. I said to him before the cock crowed, thou shalt be around thrice. Peter didn't even realize that he was doing exactly what Christ needed to do. See, we think we know who we are. We think we know what we're going to do when the pressure comes. We think we know how we'll react. But we do not know who we are like he knows who we are. And I can't, I can't, I wish, I, I wish I could just see the look on Christ's face. And, and I can say that I, I, I feel like there have been times that I've, I've, I've sensed that look as, as I've done something to grieve the Holy Spirit, as I've denied who He is in my life, and I've fallen after who I want to be, and I've fallen after what's comfortable, and I've fallen after something else other than Him, and I can't help but see uh, Peter sitting there in shame, and he realized what he'd done, and the Lord Jesus Christ didn't look at him with anger in his eyes, didn't look at him because he was going to curse him, but he looked at him with the same love and compassion that he always looked at. I believe that's why we find Peter leaving the place and bitterly weeping. See, he thought he knew who he was. He thought he knew how he reacted. He thought he knew who Jesus was. And he still didn't. He still didn't. But now he knew who he was. And he knew that Jesus knew who he was. Now those things are going to be very important as we go later into the Gospel of John. So you might say, so pastor, what are you getting at? I'm glad you asked. My three questions. Where are we comfortable? As I said, I've often heard this passage used to say that Christians ought not be comfortable in the world. But this isn't the world. This is a false religion. This is a false religion. This may have been at one time a religion that was, point to, that was supposed to point folks under Christ. But they could not see the Messiah right before them. This was a false religion. False religion is man working his way to God. You understand that? False religion. A religion that says that you can get where you need to go by how good you are or how much you do is a false religion. And that's what Judaism had become. Jesus Christ is the only way to God. Yes. We have become too comfortable with just showing up to church. I'm going I'm I'm to do a little meddling here, okay? Uh, this is the thing that God has ripped me about over the years. We've become too comfortable just showing up to church. We've become too comfortable with that being all we really need to do. Just going to church is enough. We've become too comfortable. We have become closed off from a world that we're supposed to be reaching for Christ. 
Peter was in this gated area. This area that he had to be let into. Someone had to know him to let him in. A door had to be opened for him to come in. It wasn't an all-inclusive place. Y'all understand what I'm talking about? And now listen. I've been here too. Faith Baptist Church. I know we have visitors here, okay? I know. But I've been here for a long time. And I've talked to people that have visited and used to be members of this church since I've become pastor. And you know the predominant thing that I heard over the years? Just didn't feel like we were welcome there. We didn't feel like that's a place where we could belong. And I know some of you are going, are you serious? Look, I'm not making this stuff up. I'm just telling you what I've heard. I've heard people say this is a place where they just didn't like they could be good enough. Now listen, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to say I haven't heard any of these things for a few years. Okay, God, God is doing the work in our hearts, and so I'm, I praise Him for that. But listen, He's not done. He's not done. Guess what? There's still too much of us here and not enough of Him. Yes, Amen. Thank you. We, we want to be comfortable. We like, listen, I love, I've talked, I've talked to the preachers, uh, I would love, and I'm just telling you, Mark, you know, Jim and I were talking the other day, too, I would love to be an associate pastor. I would. Somebody just say, Larry, this is what I want you to do this week, get it all done. And I'd say, okay, I like knowing what i got to get done and getting it done, and then not having to do anything. Those are some, that's my favorite checklist. What needs to be done, I do it, don't do it. I love it. That's, that, if that was my life, that'd be great. Okay? I like knowing exactly. And we like being comfortable with rules. Well, this is how you dress. This is how you sing. This is how you act. This is how you're supposed to be. We like being comfortable with all those things. And so that's what church has become a place where we just be comfortable. Everybody dresses the same. Everybody acts the same. Everybody sings the same. Everybody worships the same. And if you don't, well, you don't borrow. Go ahead and go back out the gate. We become so we like I, I like the rules. When I first got saved, I grew up in a Christian church. I grew up in a home. I grew up in a Christian school. I knew, ch -ch -ch -ch, no problem. I got a checklist. I can do it. Get her done. And I did. I did my best. Especially when people were watching, because that's what it's important. That's when it's most important. If people can see me, I gotta let them see that I'm a good Christian. And so that's what that's what I focused on. That's what we get comfortable with. And I know it would be real easy for me to just get up in here and say, well, I'm the pastor. This is what I'm saying. This is what you're supposed to do. And if you don't, you're a low down. That's not my job. I don't legislate who you are. He does. <laughs> That's just scary. It would be a lot easier if I did. It would be a lot easier to answer me than what he did to him. But that's not, that's not the role here. We like that. We like we like for someone to give us exactly how we I want to know exactly how I can accomplish what I'm supposed to accomplish. But see the problem with that is Jesus Christ has already accomplished all that needs to be accomplished. So what am I to do? What am I to do? I'm just to follow him. The rest of him. I'm to be completed in him. And guess what I have to do with it? Absolutely nothing. But that can be an uncomfortable thing because then I'm not allowed to disagree with Jesus. I'm not allowed to fight with others. I'm going to say it again. I'm not allowed to fight with others. I'm going to say it one more time. I'm not allowed to fight with others. Amen. As we've been going through Romans, uh, we've seen uh, what the, the Christian, abundant Christian life looks like. What it looks like says I'm supposed to receive everybody. I'm supposed to receive. That means embrace, love, cherish, love them like Jesus does. Guess who I'm not supposed to treat that way? Nobody. I'm supposed to treat everybody with love of Christ. No matter who you are, no matter what you do. And when I don't, I disagree with God. And I find myself in a position where now I'm either going to prove that I'm right or follow him and say he's right. It's a lot harder. Grace is a much higher standard than the law. Jesus Christ is a much higher standard than the law. We're too comfortable in church, in 
and just letting church be enough. We're too comfortable just letting what we do to call ourselves a Christian be enough. Why are we comfortable? We are comfortable with warming ourselves. We're comfortable with just taking care of what we know to take care of. We don't need to follow Jesus. We're good right here. We like being where we are. It's easy to make a fire and keep it going and stay by it. Instead of letting Jesus Christ be the one who puts the fire in us. Why follow Jesus when we have what we like right here? When everything is right here, we're okay. Who are we comfortable with? If you're more comfortable with those that keep the rules than those without the walls, you might, you might be a cold Christian. If you're more comfortable in here than you are out there, let me say this. If you're not the same person here as you are at work, why not? If you're not the same person here as you are in front of your friends, why not? If you have to be something different here than you are anywhere else, why? Why? If you're more comfortable with discussing things of God with your circle than every creature, you might be a cold Christian. And if you're more comfortable with people because you blend with them rather than standing out to those you don't blend with, you might be a cold Christian. God did not leave us here so we could keep our status quo. God did not leave us here so we could keep things warm. God did not leave us here so we could prove how good we are to those that are not. God left us here to go through temptation with him. God left us here to go through trials with him. God left us here to suffer cold with him. God left us here to be persecuted with him. God left us to die with him so we might live for him, not for ourselves. I love being comfortable. My favorite spot in my house is my recliner couch up in the loft right in front of the TV. I can plop down there and I can just spend time being nothing and doing nothing. It's comfortable. I was just telling my wife last night, we uh, we loved our vacation because my wife and I, we don't get to spend a lot of time there. I, I, you know, I don't love myself enough. Thank you, church, for allowing us to do that. I mean that. We could not have done it without you. Thank you very much. I don't get to spend the time with you, my friend. She's not out here, so I'll say all this and I won't embarrass her. She's my best friend. I can't do life without her. I don't want to do life without her. I, I, I love being cooked. We were talking last night. We, before we left for vacation, it had probably been a month before we just had a day together. We try and make dates, but then somebody calls and needs this, or somebody needs this, or and we both have a servant's heart. We just do this the heart that God has given us. And we try. And listen, I'll just be honest with you. It's the God that God, the heart that God has given me, not the heart that I have. Okay? Because when you call, I want to say, I'm not answering that. Okay? Or when somebody calls and needs me to do something, I don't want to do it. I want to be on my recliner couch. You know nothing. That's not what God's left me here to do. God's not left me here to be comfortable. I told him, I said, man, looking into next week, I haven't even been thrown a curveball. And I said, I don't even know if we're going to have a night where we can spend together next week. I still got a gift card. For my birthday that I have got to use. Okay, and I really want to use it. But we just don't, and, and I'm not complaining. I'm not complaining. What I'm telling you is, God doesn't want me to be comfortable here. God doesn't want me to be comfortable here. God doesn't want me to be comfortable anywhere except for in Him. That's where I'm supposed to find my comfort. He is the comforter, is He not? So if you're comfortable anywhere outside where the Holy Spirit allows you to be, you are a cold Christian and you need to get right. Quit arguing with God and do what He wants you to do. Anything else? Who knows how long you keep it up? And listen, I know people that keep it up until they die. Just go ahead and keep working on the fire. They're okay. Stats quo. In these walls. I'll just do my time. We're okay. I know people that just get so tired of arguing and fighting and doing all the things internally, and so they just give up. Listen. Neither one are right. 
Until Jesus Christ is enough. And that's our theme for this year. Christ is enough. Until he's enough to be comfortable in. Until he's enough to find your worth. Until he's enough to be your identity and all that you need. You're just going to be a cool Christian. That's not what God wants for us. He wants you to be converted. What? To a Christian. There's nothing to say as a cold Christian. It's just a cold human being towards Christ. Cold Christian is kind of like something else, like army intelligence, right? You're either a Christian or you're not. Because a Christian is someone who looks like Christ. And not because of how they dress and who they are and what they say and what they do, but because Christ is enough. Heads are bowed and eyes closed. Stand with me if you will. I have to close. Listen, you don't have to come to the altar. The altar is always here. It's always open. You can deal with God right where you're at. But I just want to encourage everybody that's here to quit arguing with God. Just accept the fact that He's right or not. Quit arguing with God. Quit telling Him what you believe and just trust Him. Quit telling him why you are the way that you are. And just give your life to him. Maybe you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior that I am before you. you. Know that Jesus Christ loves you enough that he gave his life. And he wants to be your life. You ever find that you know his heart and you know right where we're at, God? But I don't know who you said what to, Lord. But I know this, God. I know that you want to be our comforter, God. When we try and be comfortable anywhere else besides you, God, we are cold to Christ. Well, God, I don't want to be cold to Christ. I don't want these people that I love to be cold to Christ. Lord, I want you to use me. I want you to use us to show others just who Jesus is. But these things cannot happen if we're holding on to anything. Whether it be a tradition or another band or a viewpoint, whatever it is, God, help us to let go of that. And just hold on to you. Ask God in Jesus' precious. Here we go. Here we go. At our church, Jesus is Lord. That single belief calls us together as a community and sends us into our world with hope and purpose. At our church, your past will never define your future. There's always redemption, which means there's always a brighter day. At our church, we don't think we're better than any other church out there. We're just doing our best to become our best. At our church, we want you to believe in God, but we also want you to know that God believes in you. We are not against people who don't attend church anywhere. Instead, we pursue them with love, the very same love that's pursuing us. At our church, we're learning to serve God with all our hearts and we're learning to worship Him with all our lives. And if you're looking for the perfect church, we're not it. At our church, we will make mistakes, but we will choose to grow from them. At our church, we're part of a global community that's knit together by the resurrection of Jesus. And by the way, at our church, we believe that really happened too. At our church, we will engage with people who are in real need because we are the hands and the feet of Christ. And finally, we need you to hear this loud and clear. At our church, it's not really our church at all. It's His, and we live and move and breathe in His church for His glory and His fame, not ours. So here's the invitation. You're invited to jump in with your whole heart at your own pace and to experience the life that awaits you in Christ. Friends, this is going to be good. Welcome to our church.